Y'all, I have studied the case of Bell Gunness for literally years, and I thought I knew everything about this case until I found some old newspaper articles that just blew my mind. I found out things I had never heard. Things about our fire-starting poison princess, Bell Gunness. I mean, she really knew how to light up a room. Charming. Well, hello there, my friends. I am putting this on both of my channels, so I don't know which one you're listening to, either Evelyn Cottage or Silky Southern Tea, but this is a story that actually hits both categories, true crime, some paranormal, and some oh my god. So let's get started. Okay, Belle was born in Norway in 1859 as Brynhild Paulstadter Storseth. <laughs> I'm saying that fast five times, or even once. Her Brynhild was the daughter of a stonemason, we think. He could have been a farmer or a traveling performer. Records weren't really good back in those days, and there are multiple stories about different events of her origin. Now, let me start by saying that everything that you are going to see, all of these newspaper reports, come from the Library of Congress online. So, if you want to research Bell Gunness, there are tons and tons of newspaper stories from all over the world about this. But according to one source, they say, quote, that she is remembered as a girl assisting her father, Petters Paulson, a traveling conjurer and magician who gave performances at all the fairs in Norway. She performed as a rope dancer and often was seen in short skirts and fleshings, half freezing before the tent, extending an invitation to the public to step inside. Her three sisters and brothers also took part in the show. The father made money enough eventually to retire to a small property near Trondheim. Okay, so this right here is a little bit disturbing. If Belle was subjected to this, I can certainly see where this could have damaged her psyche. Or maybe it just made her more open to living outside the box. Who knows? We do know that she lived on a farm at one point, And... Because of this, she definitely did not want to be a Norwegian farm wife, farm hand, whatever. She wanted to get out of there. Now, Belle was not average in a lot of ways. For one thing, she was very smart and cunning, and she knew that her best prospects were to go to the U.S. So, she worked, saved her money, and off she went. Now, there are some reports that Belle Gunness had an unwanted pregnancy and miscarriage before she left Norway. Now, this isn't confirmed, but it does play into the psyche, maybe, of how her life kind of went. Was she angry, PTSD, whatever. I mean, I'm trying to find an excuse for this woman, okay? Just, just something that would explain her unhinged actions. But if that was true, she did not let disappointment stop her, and she came to America to make her mark, and boy, did she ever. Now, Brynhild was not the most attractive girl. In a society that prized petite, pretty, and demure ladies, Belle was the polar opposite. She was big. She was rugged. Belle was what we would call in the South, cornbread fed. She was a tough cookie. And when she got here, the only kind of work she knew was farm life, and so that's kind of where she started. But she wasn't your average farmhand. This 200-pound powerhouse was described by neighbors as rugged. And by rugged, they meant she could probably bench press a mule. Now, according to this article, it says she was a woman of great physical strength. And those who knew her assert that to drag 200 pounds across a yard would have been comparatively easy for her. A drayman who delivered furniture to the house when Miss Gunness first moved there in 1900 recalled that she aided in carrying several heavy pieces of furniture up a stairway. She could lug weight as well as most men I have worked with, he declared. Oh, Belle was quite a gal. By the way, when she came over here, she decided, Brynhild, no, it was not going to do. That just didn't fit in America, and she wanted to be stylish, so she changed her name to Belle. Later on, one gentleman who helped her move claimed he saw her lift a 300-pound piano all by herself. Yeah. And when asked about how she was able to do this, she supposedly quipped, I like music at home. I can't lift a piano. 
So after Belle reinvented herself, she began to take jobs as a housekeeper. And even though she was eh, pretty unattractive, she was very cunning, and she didn't let a little thing like look stop her. She actually quickly got a husband. His name was Mads Albert Sorensen, and they got married in 1884. I don't know, maybe Mads was just looking for a woman that can help him, you know, stock a warehouse. Who knows? But our lovebirds decided to open a store. They opened a candy store. Aw, isn't that sweet? Eh, not so much. They had only been in business a short while when all of a sudden the store just poof went up in flames. And if that wasn't bad enough, just a few days later, their house, poof, same thing. My, isn't that odd? What an unlucky set of circumstances. But at least they got a big fat check out of it, so that would ease the pain a little bit. Now, because they had no biological children, they began to foster and adopt kids four little bundles of joy or bigger bundles anyway two of those bundles suddenly came down with a terrible stomach cramps stomach problems and the doctor decided it was acute colitis unfortunately two of the children didn't make it but it would seem that they were insured as well hmm now i'm no doctor but when your stomach symptoms match those of poisoning maybe you should find another pediatrician or stop with the arsenic-laced lollipops. How about that? But now, things start getting juicy here, because on July 30th, 1900, poor old Mads came home from work one day. He wasn't feeling well, and he went upstairs to the bedroom. Being the loving wife that Belle was, she gave him some quinine. Now, that was a standard treatment for a lot of ailments, especially headaches and things like that. I mean, it's not like there was Tylenol and Motrin back in those days. But the thing is, nobody actually knew what his real symptoms were. He just came in, said he didn't feel good, went up to bed. And this is all according to Belle. Tragically, somewhere during the night, Mads passed away. And when they asked Belle about it, she said, Oh, he had a headache. I gave him quinine. More like strychnine, if you ask me. And so this was just another tragic coincidence to bring sorrow to poor Belle. There were whispers, of course. I mean... But it's not like she had a history of mysterious deaths of people around her, right? Oh. Wait. <laughs> now, to quote Belle's sister, Nellie Larson, she says of Belle, quote, My sister was crazy for money. When she was a girl, she never seemed to care for a man for his own sake, but only for the luxuries he could give her. She frequently told me that she would never have lived with Max Sorensen, her first husband, if he had not made such a fine home for her. At the time Sorensen died, the neighbors charged that he was poisoned, but I never thought so. He became ill one evening and died the next day. He had a good physician to attend to him. But now here is something that is far more disturbing. Apparently there was a relative, Anton Olson, who had a daughter named Jenny, who was in the care of Belle and Mads. At some point he tried to regain custody, and it says uh, that when it is reported when last seen alive by members of her father's family, the girl, talking about Jenny, had queer-looking burns all over her face and hands. She did not explain their presence. Now, I have no idea exactly how she came to be living with Mads and Belle. This would foreshadow some things that are going to happen, but that comes later in the story. They ended up saying in some accounts that he had a cerebral hemorrhage. Some people say he had a heart attack. Others did suspect poison. I mean, can you blame them, really? Belle was the reigning insurance queen. Oh, and Mads was highly insured. But it's still tragic, right? Well, now here is where it gets interesting. It would seem that Mads and Belle decided to change their life insurance. And they went from one company to another. Now, it just so happens that in between these two policies, there was one day that overlapped where they were double covered. Strangely, or luckily enough, this is the day that Mads decided to die. Yeah, what fortunate timing. You know, so Belle and the kids could be taken care of. Very fortuitous. And our poor girl Belle, in the midst of grieving for her children and her husband, she headed on down to the insurance office and collected on both policies. 
Now we're talking about $150,000 in today's money. Now I'm not saying that Bell had anything to do with this, but if I was an insurance investigator, I'd be raising an eyebrow or maybe giving the side eye. Hmm. So now here is Belle, fresh off of her husband's mysterious demise, and she decided what she needed was a new man in her life, and enter Peter Gunnis. Now, I don't know how she did this. I mean, girl had skills, let's be honest. They tied the knot in April of 1902, and as Peter was settling into wedded bliss, Belle, she was just getting started. Now, Peter had an infant daughter from a previous relationship. When they got married, that infant daughter passed away within the first week. I guess Belle decided she wasn't going to do a 2 a.m. feeding call. And Peter, I guess he didn't get the memo that living with Belle was hazardous to your health. Now, back in these days, infant deaths were not that uncommon as were childhood deaths. I mean, deaths in general. There weren't antibiotics and things like that, and especially infants did have a high mortality rate, so it could have been passed off as just a tragedy if you didn't know Belle's history. Well, now, Peter Gunness was not going to be outdone by his infant daughter, so it wasn't too much longer before he himself joined the Oops, I Died Club. Now, Belle's explanation for this was that it was a tragic accident with a sausage grinder. Yeah, she says that they were working one day and the sausage grinder was on the top shelf and as Peter went to get it or something knocked the shelf, she's unsure, the sausage grinder came from the top shelf and hit him right in the skull with a blade. Killed him instantly. Now here's a safety lesson for you. Sausage grinders always go in the lower cabinets. Remember that. I mean, unless you want a cheap lobotomy. So, here is poor old Belle widowed again for the second time. But she was always a pillar of strength, and she managed to dry up her crocodile tears and head on down to the insurance office once again. I mean, it's tragic, but a girl's got to eat, right? So with only the insurance money to keep her warm, in her deep grief, she decided to invest in a farm in LaPorte, Indiana. Now, she probably needs, needed something to take her mind off of all these tragedies, and because of the number of deaths surrounding her, I imagine she needed to get out of Dodge as well. So she packed up her daughters, Myrtle and Lucy, and also Jenny, who was a foster daughter at the time, and they all headed to LaPorte. Belle had picked a 48-acre farm out in the middle of nowhere. Now, one thing that was interesting about this farm that she chose, the house had formerly been known as a house of ill repute. You know, wink, wink. The ladies of the evening liked to entertain there. Now, I'm just thinking no self-respecting female would buy such a place, right? With such a reputation. Oh, but Belle didn't mind, because I think she had gotten some inspiration with maybe a slightly different and darker twist. So, you see, Belle, after all of this tragedy, going through two husbands and a whole lot of insurance money, she decided she needed a new hobby. So Belle put on her thinking cap, and she came up with a brilliant plan. Why not advertise for a new husband in the Norwegian newspapers. Now, these newspapers specifically targeted migrants who didn't speak much English and didn't really know people and really wouldn't be missed, right? So here is where Belle makes her plan to become the ultimate catfish. She wrote her ad in the paper as seductively as possible. So picture this. Wanted. One sucker. Uh, I mean, gentleman with a fat wallet and a desire to disappear. Oh, I mean, join fortunes, join fortunes! With a comely widow, AKA catfish, on a charming murder farm. Oh, I mean, a lovely estate in Indiana. Must be willing to visit in person because how else can I get to know you better? Yeah, triflers need not apply. Translation is because mama's got bills and bodies to bury. And you might be thinking, who on earth would fall for such an obvious trap? Well, you have to remember that these were lonely men looking for a good home-cooked meal. Some nostalgia about Norway. So they came flocking to Belle's farm like moths to a flame. 
or like pigs to a slaughterhouse. Now, according to Harold Schechter, he was the Sherlock Holmes of historical psychopaths. He said that our dear Belle wasn't just your average farmhouse femme fatale. Oh, no, no. She was a regular Machiavelli. Quote, like many psychopaths, Schechter explained, she was very shrewd in identifying potential victims. And by shrewd, he means that she had a PhD in lonely Norwegian bachelor studies. <laughs> yeah. She knew exactly what would warm their sad hearts. So you can imagine Belle sitting at her kitchen table in her sexy woolen undergarments, looking like a troll. I mean, that's how I feel in the mornings, but... <laughs> and she would be scrolling through the old Tinder, and she had a killer sales pitch. A little slice of Norwegian heaven, complete with home cooking that'll knock your socks right off, and maybe your pulse too. She painted a picture so seductive that these poor saps thought that they had stumbled into paradise, not a one-way ticket to hog heaven. But that comes up later. Now, a very curious thing is that although her ads drew lots of people, her neighbors saw a lot of men come into Belle's house. But strangely enough, they didn't see him leaving. Hmm, what's up with that? Now, I have to wonder, really, what men thought once they actually got there and met Belle. She was clearly not as she described, okay? Comely in her ads in those days meant, you know, beautiful, hot. So basically, she was saying she was a hot, wealthy widow looking for a man to snuggle up with. But here is how the people of LaPorte, Indiana, her neighbors and acquaintances, actually described Belle according to a newspaper article. Y'all, this is horrible. Mrs. Gunnis was a fat, coarse-featured woman who stood about 5 feet 7 and weighed about 220 pounds. She had a big, heavy head, my God, a mop of coarse hair of a muddy brown, little eyes that just missed being black, huge hands, but feet grotesquely small for the burden they had to support. Everybody who knew her agrees that she was far from attractive. Most of her acquaintances describe her as repulsive. Some of their neighbors go further than that. Quote, more a devil than a woman is the way William Deslane puts it. And to he ought to know because the, his farm is next to the Gunnis place. My God, can you imagine being described in the newspapers like that? That is brutal. So we can see that they probably didn't find her physically appealing when they got there, but she could cook, I guess. And she made them believe that she was desperately in love with them. And this is all in the letters leading up to them meeting. Belle was playing a big game and she was constantly at the post office every day, looking for and mailing letters. It was a whole racket she had going on. Now, they really didn't have a whole lot of time to back out once they got there and Belle was cooking and professing her love. I guess sometimes they just thought, eh, well, she can cook. I'm lonely. But they didn't really have much time to reconsider because Belle would have them go straight to the bank, put all their money in, usually in a joint account because, you know, it was going to be their money as soon as they were wed. And she wasn't going to take a chance on cold feet unless they were six feet under. Now let's go back to little Jenny, who was her foster child, adopted daughter, and bless her heart, Jenny didn't get the memo about the murder club. You know, that you don't talk about the murder club, because that's exactly what Jenny did. This little detective decided to go to school and tell her classmates about the day that Peter Gunnis died. So she casually drops the bombshell, yeah. My mama killed my papa. She hit him with a meat cleaver and he died. Oh, but shh, don't tell anybody. Now, when Belle found out, she was not so excited about little Jenny becoming a true crime podcaster, so to speak. And so one day, Jenny just, poof, disappeared. Yeah. So when people asked, because Jenny was well known, well, Belle told them she had sent her to a school out in California, you know, to get the proper education, etiquette, maybe charm. You know which school I'm talking about, the one that doesn't allow visits or, you know, letters or contact of any kind. Yeah, that one. That's the one she went to. Now, people were really curious and suspicious, but nobody could prove anything different at the time. And now with Jenny out of the way, Belle could follow her dreams. 
and she had at least a five-year plan. I mean, it's good to have plans and goals, right? But then there was another problem that arose, and his name was George Anderson. Now, George was from Missouri, and he had kind of thought he hit the jackpot when he saw Belle's ad. And so he comes to the farm with a pocket full of cash and a heart full of love. But little did he know that he was going to be writing his own personal horror story. So there George was, lying in bed at Belle's farmhouse, you know, dreaming of Norwegian meatballs and marital bliss, probably. When suddenly, boom, he wakes up to see Belle standing over him, looming like a hungry troll. And as George felt the hair on his arm stand up, he realized the eyes he was looking into were not saying true love. Now, it was something more like, I wonder how you taste with some fava beans and a nice Chianti. <laughs> Needless to say, George hightailed it out of there faster than you could say Uber. Meanwhile, the neighbors are starting to get a bit suspicious. Not only are people coming and not leaving, but Belle has decided to spend a lot of time in her hog pen. And she had strangely developed an obsession with wooden boxes. Yeah, a lot of those were coming in and going out. And there Belle was, like, lifting and tossing these heavy trunks like they were full of feathers. As we'll see later, there is a whole other story about these boxes, and it's not exactly what you might think. And now, another concern the neighbor had were these visiting cousins. Belle always had cousins coming over to stay at the farm. Now, according to the neighbors, it was like a revolving door. There was at least one man a week. Yeah, a week. They came from Kansas, South Dakota, Wisconsin, Chicago. She had men coming in from everywhere. Again, girl got skills. But now here is the cherry on top of this murder Sunday. Belle was always careful to keep the kids away from the cousins because that's natural for a family reunion, isn't it? Oh, I don't know. I guess it depends on your family. <laughs> so by now it is 1906, and our dear Belle wasn't content with the already impressive body count she had, and she decides she needs another victim for her collection. So enter Andrew, I hope I say this right, Helgeline, 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 who stumbled across Belle's personal ad in the Minneapolis newspaper, and almost immediately, these two lovebirds were exchanging letters that would make even Nicholas Sparks blush. Belle, she was quite the smooth talker, and she wrote to Andrew, saying, We shall be so happy once you get here. My heart beats in wild rapture for you. My Andrew, I love you. But then, in a twist that should have sent Andrew heading for the hills, she added, Come prepare to stay forever. Spoiler alert, she wasn't talking marriage. And Andrew, bless his heart, he was so smitten he couldn't see the red flags that were like weaving right in front of his face. So on January 3rd, 1908, he packed his bags and headed to Laporte, and he was ready to start his new life with Belle. Of course, his new life was going to be a lot shorter and more permanent than he could imagine. Now, Belle had been given Oscar-worthy performances for all of her friends, neighbors, whatever, to explain all of these weird goings-on at the farm. But then she got a letter from Andrew's brother. Now, his name, y'all, I think this is pronounced Assel. Assel? Helgeline? I'm, I'm not saying anything bad. That's... It's his name. <laughs> I don't know what to say. So apparently, when Andrew did not get in contact, right, in any form of communication with his brother, um, Hassel got really upset and he began to wonder where Andrew went. So he writes to Belle asking some serious questions. Well, now Belle, she tried to pull off her best confused and concerned act and she wrote to Hassel and she was just a little bit indignant as well. You wish to know where your brother keeps himself? Well, this is just what I would like to know. But it seems almost impossible for me to give a definite answer. Uh, the translation is, um, he's probably around here somewhere, but I can't remember where I put him. Oh, but it gets better because then she begins to embellish. She is quite the creative storyteller. And she throws out suggestions like maybe he went to Chicago. Or he did say something about wanting to go back to Norway to visit family. 
But unfortunately for Belle, Essel was not buying this. As it turned out, he wasn't gullible like all of her other victims. Now this was a real problem for her killer career. When he kept demanding answers, Bell suggested that he sell his assets, yeah, and come to Indiana, where they could search together. <laughs> yeah. But Azul remained unimpressed with Bell and her sweet as honey demeanor and her letters. He kept the pressure on. But now, in the meantime, Bell had hired a farmhand na named Ray Lamphere. Now, Ray wasn't just any old farmhand. He had a crush on Belle bigger than her body count. I guess it's like they say, there's a lid for every jar. And Andrew felt like he was Belle's lid. He quickly fell in love with the mistress of murder. But now Belle had other plans, and Ray was just in the way. Again, how does she keep collecting men? The girl got skills. She didn't want anything to interfere with her business of men showing up at the farm with fat wallets and a death wish. So when Andrew arrived, Ray, he was so jealous. And he actually stormed off in a jealous rage because he felt that he should be the master of Gunna's farm and holding Belle ever so closely. Yee. But Belle wasn't quite done with Ray yet, so she puts on her acting face and she sashays herself into an attorney's office in Laporte, Indiana, and she spun a tale that would even make Reddit jealous. Oh, please help me. She probably wailed while clutching her pearls. I don't know. I don't think Belle wore, wore pearls. <laughs> I, I could be wrong, but she said, I fear that one of these nights he's going to burn my house to the ground. He was so jealous. I mean, the attorney's probably looking at her like, now, she said that he had gone mad with jealousy, and she had to fire him, and now he had threatened to burn her house down. She also declared her need for a will, because she said, that man is going to hurt me. I fear for my life. Now, after she gave her performance at the attorney's office, she decided to go about town and buy a few things. So she bought a couple of toys for the kids at home. Oh, what a sweet mama you are. And two gallons of kerosene. Oh. Flammable liquids for the kiddos, huh? And that night, wouldn't you know it, the Gunnis Farm does go up in flames. Gee, I wonder who did that. What a coincidence. Now, when the authorities showed up, it was like the scene of a horror movie. Because in the basement, in some twisted game of hide-and-seek, they discover the bodies of Belle's three children. But they also find the body of a headless woman. Now, most people would assume this was Belle, but let's be real, our Belle was never one for doing things the easy way. Well, quickly, because of what Belle had said, Ray gets slapped to, with charges of arson. And the police start their scavenger hunt for Belle's head. But there is so much going on here, folks. Now, the police are out there for days. And who shows up out of the blue but Azel Helgeline? You know, that was the brother of Andrew. He had read about the fire in the papers, and he just decided to come and check it out. See if maybe this is where Andrew had gone to. So he starts helping the police sort through the rubble, and just when he's about to call it quits and head home, he has that nagging feeling that maybe, you know, he should just look a little bit more. Yeah, he probably should have just went on home. So he's looking around but not finding anything, so he walks on over to the hog pen and he asks one of the farm hands, you know, say, buddy, have you seen any suspicious holes around here lately? To which the farm hand replies, oh, you know, now that I think about it, Belle did have a, some holes dug and she said she was filling them with trash. I don't know what was in those bags, but they're right about here. So asshole goes over to investigate and he starts digging around well in one of the holes it's not very long before he hits something very macabre as he pulls this sack out of the ground it is the stuff of nightmares when he looks in he sees andrew's head hands and feet and they all kind of look like they've been through a meat grinder or worse so then they did some further digging around the farm. They're not just looking for Belle's head, they're looking for full-blown bodies. In total, they find 11 burlap sacks, each containing body parts that had been kind of hacked up, and some of them 
quote, looked like jelly. Now, back in these times, people, I don't know, I don't know, but you'll see this in a lot of crime cases. It became a big fiasco. It was the thing, when you had a murder house, like, people would come, like, from all over, visitors, even from different states, and they would walk around the crime scene, walk into the house. It was nuts by today's standards. So the search for bodies in, at this place became so well known that people actually set up, like, vendors. You had popcorn and peanuts and whatever, because people get hungry when they're nosing around a crime scene, right? Of course. That's a great place to set up shop. So people came by the droves while the police are digging out there. They're on the perimeters, and of course they can't go in Bell's house because it's burned down, but they can definitely see the remains of the basement. And because of all this, even in those times, this story went viral. There were headlines all over the United States. They named her things like not only the Black Widow, but Hell's Bell, the Indiana Ogress, Mistress of the Castle of Death. I mean, it was a PR nightmare if you were Belle. They also described the Gunnis farm as a horror farm or a death garden. And I guess it kind of was. One of the things that they found quickly when they were digging up bodies, they did find and identify, sadly, the body of Jenny, you know, the daughter who supposedly went to the charm school in California. Yeah, they definitely found her remains and she was identified. Now, there were so many bodies and pieces of bodies, and you have to think, DNA was not a thing back then. So, you know, they kind of just assumed pieces went together, I mean, if they could. Um, they were scattered all over the place, and to be honest, nobody really knows how many bodies were out there, and how many bodies may still be somewhere on the land. And now, we still come back to the body and Belle's missing head. Now, they did find a few teeth. And some articles say part of the jawbone, some people say teeth. That was all of the remains that they could find, you know, really, um, because the head was missing. So you don't have a head, you've got a few teeth or whatever. It, it, it's kind of, where did they come from? You know, it's very confusing. And although this has been widely disputed from time to time, there was a dentist that swore that those teeth were bells which does lead some people to speculate that Belle literally pulled the teeth out of her jawbone just so she couldn't be identified. Although they tried to officially say that that was Belle's body in the basement, people that knew her said no way because this body was much smaller than Belle. Now remember, Belle was a big old girl. Now here are a few articles I wanted to share with you understand that the police, the community, they really wanted to convince people, you know, that Belle was not a threat, that she did indeed perish at Gunnis Farm. But if you look towards the bottom, it says, Dr. C.P. Norton, a dentist who found that the piece of charred bone presented characteristics which he had observed while working on her teeth. First of all, it's a charred bone and, you know, x-ray, what, I don't even know. Did they have x-rays back then? I'm not sure. But, again, he's identifying it, but he does have a motive. Now, in the second article, it says the story that the woman did not perish in the flames is objected to further because of the fact that she left in her safety deposit vault a considerable amount of cash and also a will disposing of her property in the event of death of herself and children to an orphan asylum in Chicago. Aww. Okay, so that, you know, el that fact eliminates the chief motive for the woman's substitution of another body in place of her own, with the possible exception that she herself might be financially interested in the asylum which she made the beneficiary in her will. That actually makes a lot of sense to me, y'all, because the dealings that she had with people in Chicago, as we will continue to see, it made a great escape. All right, I'm going to donate all of my money to this asylum. You know, great. She goes to Chicago. She's the beneficiary, right? She's got it all set up. Makes perfect sense to me. 
Now, going on, it says a rumor that has been current in Laporte since the discovery of the wholesale crime at the Gunnis homestead, but which has not been positively verified, is to the effect that a woman was taken to the Gunnis house from a Lakeshore train on the night the house was destroyed by fire. Visitors to the house were quite frequent, and the baggage men of Laporte appear to have taken a number of trunks to the place. The possibility of a woman thus far unaccounted for having gone to the Gunnis home the night of the fire. So yeah, this mysterious woman appears, hmm, strangely the night of the fire, and nobody seems to know what happens to her. Now, in the last article, it says, Attorneys for the defense of Ray Lamphere charged with the murder of Belle Gunnis said that and her three children are in receipt of a letter from a man in Arkansas whose identity they refuse to divulge, but who formerly lived in Marshall County, this state, who states that Mrs. Gunnis es escaped in men's clothing and that on May 6th, five days after she is alleged to have been buried, burned to death, he greeted a letter from her. He says he will produce this letter and give the evidence. So once again, I mean, it makes perfect sense to me that Belle, dressed in men's clothes, she could certainly have passed for a man and, you know, got on out of there. What do y'all think? So it would definitely cause concern if the body that they find without the head is much smaller. Now, there were a lot of rumors from people that had come up missing in Chicago and there was also a new woman that had come to the farm seeking work who they're not really sure if they she made it she was supposed to come and then all of a sudden you got this body with no head it just seems pretty sus and convenient to me now here's an article that solidifies to me that the body they found is not bell gunness according to dr h h long one of the physicians who performed the autopsy on the body Okay, if you'll go down to the bottom of that column, it says the bottom, the body at the morgue is not that of Mrs. Gunnis because it is not correctly proportioned. It is that of a rather plump woman of the same general contour of Mrs. Gunnis, but weighing between 150 and 160 pounds. Mrs. Gunnis weighed fully 225 pounds. The arm that was burned off and found beside the body is well formed. The fingers show evidence of careful manicuring, and that was something that Mrs. Gunnis knew nothing about. Basing my statements on the statistics and figures of the eminent physicians of this country in Great Britain, I find that the body at the morgue is almost five inches shorter than the body of Mrs. Gunnis would be under similar circumstances. The fire would, of course, cause the body to lose weight, but the general physical outline of the woman would remain. Now listen to this. Mrs. Gunnis was a woman of unusual appearance. She was large, bony, powerful looking, with square jaws and black eyes. She was a woman who would attract attention anywhere from a lack of womanly characteristics. She wore a large fur coat during the winter and her long strides together with her remarkable countenance and her really vicious appearance gave her an aspect that was almost terrifying. Oh, isn't that nice? Now let's go back to Ray Lamphere. He gets slapped with the arson charge, but they couldn't pin the murder on him. But it was kind of like charging Al Capone with tax evasion, you know. Sure, he did it, but we all know that's not the real crime here. Now this story does go into some depth. At one point, Ray was in the company of a black female and he blamed her for the murder, ar arson, whatever, the crimes of that happened at the Gunnis farm. But as it turned out, once they investigated her, they said, no way, she is not. She was found not guilty, you know, public opinion, whatever. She wasn't involved. So it all fell back on Ray. All they really knew is that he probably did b burn the farm down. And for that, he does go to jail. And unfortunately, he spends what little is left of his life in jail. But he does have a deathbed confession. According to Ray, Belle had quite the system going. She would spike people's coffee because apparently her cooking wasn't deadly enough on its own. And then she would also, you know, in the head because if the coffee didn't work, that definitely would. And then she would play butcher. Now, according to Ray, his job was to do the planting. 
In here, I thought gardening was a relaxing hobby. All of this sort of ruse is very reminiscent of the bloody benders, you know? That was just <laughs> a few states away. Like, it's kind of crazy. It's the same operation, sort of, right? You get lured in, you're fed, you're gone. But now things get really, really juicy. Because with Ray in the slammer for arson, people are still wondering, did Belle really bite the dust or did she escape? It was kind of a legend. What happened? But let's fast forward to 1931. And there is a lady in Los Angeles, California named Esther Carlson. And she was apparently trying to recreate Belle's greatest hits. Yeah. She gets arrested for poisoning a Norwegian-American man and attempting to make off with his cash. That sounds familiar, but it gets even spicier. This Esther person, she is a dead ringer for Belle Gunness. And if that wasn't suspicious enough, she's got some photos of kids that look suspiciously like Belle's kids. And the age ma matches up, because you know it has been quite a few years since the death of Belle Gunness. Hmm. Esther is the same age. Matches the description. Looks a lot like Belle Gunness. I mean, what are the odds? But unfortunately, before we could get any answers as to whether Esther could possibly be Belle Gunness, she was in jail waiting for trial when she decides to pass away from tuberculosis. Oh, man. How convenient. So let's fast forward even further because now we have DNA, right? And so they find some old letters that Belle licked when she was sending them and they thought, hmm, we can get some trace DNA off of there. Let's see. I'm not sure if they were trying to compare them with Esther's or with somebody else or I don't know. But they were trying to get the DNA to say for sure whether she died. Unfortunately, even with our best techniques, they could not determine if it was Belle Gunness or not. So, look, did she leave and sit Mai Tais on a beach somewhere, you know, until she decided to start her Lonely Hearts column again? I don't know. Or did she actually pass away in the farmhouse fire? Now, I'm going to say no. I'm, I'm going to say no. And here's the reason. Because no matter what happened to Belle, there is literally no reason if Ray was the perpetrator, as Belle said, for him to decapitate her okay if he was just jealous and wanted her gone and and you know whatever i mean just torch the place right why would someone take the head of of another person especially if let's say it was a family or a friend of a victim that you know got a clue you would want her to be identified so the fact that she could not possibly be identified according to the methods back in those days. And people said that wasn't her body. Mm. I think it was a plan, a very well thought out plan by Belle because everything was kind of coming down on her at one time. Let's look at some stuff that happened. When you start looking at old newspapers and other theories, you will find that Belle was actually involved in some nefarious potential trafficking. Now, according to this article, it says authorities have become more thoroughly possessed of the idea that the woman may have been acting as a murder fence, disposing of the victims of others whose bodies were shipped to her from Chicago, that she might bury them with the corpses of her own individual murder mail. The evidence adduced from Drayman, who brought the heavy trunks and boxes to the Gunness home, lends color to this view. So basically it goes on to say that she would get trunks in March with things like potatoes and wallpaper, but it's strange. They always had to bring them through the cellar and she acted very suspiciously. Now on further investigation, I will tell you that there was a lot of suspicion of trafficking of people as well, secretaries, people who answered all kinds of ads and it kind of suggested that Belle was in collusion with nefarious people from Chicago as they were all in the murder business. Now also it got so bad 
at this point in Chicago that they shut down for a time period all of the ads that were marital, okay? Because there were so many people disappearing from Chicago. Now, however, I wonder if they did turn up <laughs> anonymously in LaPorte, Indiana. We will never know the full extent to Bell's dealings, but I'm pretty sure this is what was going on. So you see, Bell seemed to have a whole business going. It wasn't just personal. It would seem that she had friends in high places. And in that case, when she felt the pressure of the police being involved, Ray, and then you have this asshole who just will not leave the case alone, she probably needed to disappear. And it sounds like she had some friends who could make it happen, if you know what I mean. Wink, wink. So that's my theory. I think she did leave. Whether she turned into another murderess somewhere else, I think it's very likely, unless she was paid enough to be, you know, taken care of well into, you know, the future. I really want to know, was she this Esther Carlson? Mm. Wouldn't that be something? Now let's move to the paranormal part of this story. Today, it is just farmland. There are no buildings, structures, anything that would suggest that that was the Gunnis farm. However, people do report very strange lights in the field at some times, and people who pass by and have no idea that this was the former Death Garden often get a very strange vibe. They say the air just changes. Now, you can look it up on a map and kind of see exactly where it was, but remember, this is private property, and I do not suggest that you go nosing around there. However, I would not be surprised if there are lingering spirits, because we don't really know how many victims. If she was averaging one a week, then there were many years there that uh, she was, you know, planting her little, you know, death garden. So there are, I'm sure, many, many people who disappeared and nobody ever knew what became of them. So, of course, I would think having a strangeness in the air, strange lights, etc., that seems quite normal to me. All right, so that is the whole story of Belle Gunness, some things that I did not know about her and what she might also have been doing with, you know, other people. It was a big operation. And... Girl got skills. That's that's the thing. That's my takeaway. Girl got some skills. I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, hit the like button. What stories do you want to hear about? Comment below. I hope you have a wonderful day, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.